So today what we're going to do is talk about connecting feed management and whole farm nutrient management. And as I share with my colleagues, kind of my change in my career, I spent a lot of time on the front end of the cow doing feeding work and about 15 years ago started to spend a lot more time on whole farm nutrient management, which meant moving to the other end of the cow. So in this case, what we're trying to do is connect both ends and um, connect that into the cropping system as well. Um, so you'll hear from myself, Andrew Watson, um, from the University of Nebraska, and then Brian Rickert. Um, this uh, feed management tools or feed nutrient management tools that we're going to talk to you about today have been developed with funding from a USDA NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant, and it was part of an effort to uh, um, design and implement a, um, an approach for the NRCS Feed Management 592 practice standard. The development team um, <clears throat> is a group that's worked on this over the last decade, even prior to funding from, from USDA and RCS. And it was um, some of the original developers were Rick Kelsch and Galen Erickson, the University of Nebraska, Ray Massey from the University of Missouri, uh, myself here at WSU, Tamily Nenick, Brian Rickert, and Todd Applegate, who are all at Purdue. And then we had a number of graduate students who made um, substantive contributions to the project as well. It was Rebecca White, Aaron Jones, Andrea Watson, and then Virgil Bremer. And our current programmer uh, for our tool that's on the, on the net or the internet at present is uh, Kevin Brown. And he's located here in Washington State. So the acronyms that we have chosen uh, for the two tools one is FNMP dollar sign dot net. That is a uh, web version, and it is for uh, swine, poultry, and dairy. And then the B FNMP tool is one that is um, available for use on your own computer, and it's available through a website at the University of Nebraska. So again, here we have FNMP as a web-based version, and that's the uh, web link there, HTTP um, FNMP dot net. And that'll get you to that tool. And then the BFNMP tool, personal computer version, and that's available at the, the address noted below. Our hopes are in the coming months we uh, attempt to move the BFNMP um, to the net version as well so they're all on a, the Internet. It makes it a lot easier for use as well as for upgrading um, and keeping compatibility with software and so forth. So the primary purpose um, of these tools is to connect feed management with whole farm nutrient management. Um, it allows you to ask a lot of quick what-if questions or make quick comparisons of strategies, feeding strategies, um, cropping strategies, and get an idea of the impact they might have from a nutrient management standpoint as well as an economic standpoint because we do have economics tied into this particular tool. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, it's to support the impl implementation of the NRCS feed management practice standard. So functionality pieces of the tool um, does calculate mineral volume and nutrient content. It looks at land requirements for agronomic utilization of manure. Um, it also gives you information on labor and land application, equipment time requirements, and travel distance manure hauling. So all those issues related to um, size of your land base and so forth, and you know how far you might have to travel to, to get all of your manure applied. Um, the costs associated with land application, the potential nitrogen and phosphorus nutrient value of the manure. So we uh, base that on uh, fertilizer values for NPK. And then the costs associated with feed changes. Um, so with, with regard to compatibility with existing information, that was something we were we, we were really keen to try to, to make sure that we were being compatible with other approaches that were already uh, existing within it in the NRCS system. So we <clears throat> tied all of our information in the tool back to the manure production standards um, that were from the ASAB, which is American Society of um, Biological Engineers. And in 2005, there was a group of us that worked to, to revise those standards. And then those standards were then brought into the NRCS system in their Ag Waste Field Management Handbook. So all the numbers in the program are the most current. And then 
as it relates to nutrient transformation and fate of uh, nutrients, particularly nitrogen, they're based on NRCS reference documents. And again, most of that's within the Egg Waste Field Management Handbook. Really didn't want to have a tool out there that, that was working uh, dissimilarly from other tools that might be within the, the toolbox of, of NRCS. Felt that that was not an appropriate uh, approach. We also wanted to create some transparency and flexibility within the tool. And um, so all the equations, um, and we'll give you an example of this, are used. They're available as pop-up boxes, so you don't have to wonder. It's a black box, and how do I get these numbers? where well, you can actually see how they're calculated. And then if you have a more local uh, relevant information that you think is a more appropriate value um, that you might use at your county or at the farm level, uh, you can go in and override the um, default values that are in the tool. So let's move back to the feed management practice standard. Um, a number of years ago, whenever we first started working on this project um, to develop a, an implementation plan for feed, feed management at the national level, um, there was a number of um, steps, and we, five steps that we decided were appropriate for trying to um, assess and implement uh, the feed management practice standard. So the first activity is to determine the purpose of that standard, and, and this is all defined within the practice standard uh, description. The primary people who would be involved with that would be the nutrient management planner and a producer. Um, the second step would be to identify conditions where the practice applies and assess what real opportunities are for feed management to have an impact on whole farm nutrient management. And again, the primary um, individuals involved would be the nutrient management planner and the producer. The third step is the economic evaluation, and that's where this tool that we're talking about today has its key role. So this economic evaluation at step three would involve the nutrient management planner, the producer, and now we're bringing in the nutritionist uh, advisor that, that works with a particular farm. Step four would be actually developing the feed management plan, and that involves the nutritionist and the producer. And then step five is to implement and monitor and keep this uh, feed management plan uh, a live document so that it um, continues uh, year after year. And again, that's uh, primarily a responsibility nutritionist producer, but could also involve the uh, nutrient management planner as well. So again, we're, we're looking at the step three of this five-step system as we're really focusing today's webcast. So if we look at a cartoon character of what uh, FNMP tries to accomplish at a, at a whole farm level is it connects feeding with whole farm level. Um, as noted on this particular slide, the farm boundary is in the red dashed line. Your barn boundary uh, where your animals are housed, in this case, and again, this is a dairy example, is in green. And then um, we've got the obvious flow of, of uh, nutrients that are contained in feed to the cow as it comes out of the cow to the barn floor, goes on out, might go through liquid solid separation. Solids may or may not come back in and be used as bedding. It might go as composted solids. Um, and then a lagoon, a liquid portion obviously stored in a lagoon. And then that transferred onto crop fields. So these are the, the basic components that we capture in the FNMP tool. Um, <clears throat> we also look at imports of bedding to the farm. That's a part of the tool. And exports, in the case of dairy, would be... Um, milk uh, nutrients uh, exported off farm. If you also have the opportunity to export uh, the manure solids that would be from the liquid solid separation, could be um, exported off farm if they're not used as bedding or not used as uh, composted solids for um, crop production. And then finally, um, because nitrogen um, does tend to be volatile within the, the livestock system, we have all these different points where you see the um, uh, ammonia coming off um, from either the barn, the um, composted solids, liquid in the lagoon, um, at the point of crop application, um, and also from the uh, composted solids. So these are all accounted for uh, as a part of the tool. So when you go to the FNMP.net, the web version, this is what you'll see. This is the very first screen. So it's, it's pretty crisp and easy to read. Uh, you'll, you'll find some background information, and at the bottom there's contact, general questions to myself, and if you have dairy-specific, poultry, or swine-specific, you've got the, 
the appropriate reference folks to contact there. So four steps for utilization of FNMP. First one is to, to look at the facilities. So what you'll do is define the facilities that house the animals of interest. And this is just to simply come up with a, a short description that makes sense to you as the user. The um, second step then is to define the manure handling portion of the, of the farm. And so uh, this is um, tied in a bit with the housing uh, and the manure handling system. And the third one is the crops. You want to define the crops that are grown and um, some general characteristics of those. And then the last step is to look at the economics. You define the economic conditions for the, the whole live crop, livestock crop system. And you'll see all of these demonstrated as a result of the webcast today. So we talk about scenarios. They're a collected set of all the, the data for that particular farm. In the screenshot I have here, you'll notice that um, this particular one says that um, this is for the webcast for today, and my description was demo. So again, you can put whatever you want in there as long as it makes sense to you or the producer you're working with. You also notice right below that, it can either be expressed on a dry basis or an as is. In this particular one, I click the radio button there for it to be as is. Most of the time we work with dairy operations, it would be on a dry basis, but with swine and poultry, we tend to do it on an as is. So that's why we have that option there. In the background, you can see the different scenarios that I have populated on my um, site that I go to. So I've got uh, dairy, poultry, and swine uh, examples in there. And those can be stored in the library um, that are available to you at any time. OK, so uh, the next step then is um, to go ahead and add this uh, facilities uh, description. Um, and in this case, we've got uh, additional information we're putting in. We're saying it's a webcast uh, demo barn number five. So again, just adding a little bit more detail. There might be you know, up to um, two to 10 or however many barns on an operation. You can individually um, account for each one of those. Then um, on this screen, one of the things I want to point out is we've moved now to the animal step. And here you have the opportunity to pick either dairy group, poultry, um, egg poultry meat or swine. And with regard to dairy, the, the drop-down box indicates we have three choices, dry, lactating, or heifers. In this case, I click the uh, dry cows. So the description I'd said was the back 40. So these are cows on the back 40 acres. The number of animals was 20. And automatically, it pops in a body weight for those. If you don't like that body weight, and this is the default that's in there, you can change that for whatever you think is more appropriate. The boxes down below for the feed information, those are all defaults as well. And if you uh, would like to change any of those, um, the user is able to do that as well. At the bottom of that particular page, here where I have noted in red circle, it says explain these values. And this is where I'd mentioned earlier where you can actually see how the, how the uh, calculations are done. So um, this next screenshot shows you if you had clicked that button, this is what would come up. You would get a, a document that shows you um, how you calculate the dry matter excreted for those animals, nitrogen excreted, phosphorus, and so forth. So you don't have to wonder um, just how the data is being calculated. You can actually um, look it up. In our handling system then, um, when we get to that step, we can, um, for the housing type, we have three opportunities there for dairy, bedded pack, free stall, and tie stall. And for uh, bedding then, for those, we can pick either chopped hay or straw, loose hay or straw, sand, soil, or limestone, and then shavings or sawdust. We also do have the opportunity, as you'll note a little bit later, that uh, another bedding source can be uh, the manure solids from the operation. So that is uh, worked into the overall uh, functionality of the tool. Um, we get down to manure separation and um, you would have the opportunity, if you were not doing uh, liquid solid separation, you could either do a one cell anaerobic treatment lagoon um, or a lagoon with solids removed annually, annually. But if you have a liquid solid separation system, what we've done is we've programmed it in there so that it would either have uh, one of five levels of, of solids removal. And this was based on all of re published research data. And again, we've um, put some default numbers in there, um, and they're based on what's been published. If you think your system has a uh, different recovery of nutrients in the solids, you can uh, simply put those numbers in yourself uh, in the, the boxes off to the side. 
Uh, then we move on to where the liquids are stored after that liquid solid separation. So you've got uh, four uh, options here. Then with regard to um, what happens with the solids, you can either use them as bedding, and they would get uh, entered back into the barn as a way, in terms of the way the tool works, or the solids could be exported off farm, so that subtracts them out, and you're not considering for um, use on the farm. And then the solids could be composted and land applied. So all those options are available. The green uh, table at the bottom then uh, tracks uh, the change in solids as it goes from one system to another and it goes from one form to another in terms of going from a liquid to, say, um, manure solids. It also tracks where the nitrogen phosphorus, um, either as phosphorus pounds or as P2O5, and then potassium as either potassium or K2O. Again, trying to create some um, uh, understanding between nutritionists and agronomists in terms of the different um, common forms of thinking about phosphorus and potassium in particular. So with regard to the crop system, we have it in there. The functionality currently is what we call a simple crop system. So we're doing is looking at typical field size, and we look at the percent of land available to apply manure. Um, and in, in, uh, as an example, you could put in 40 acres, and you could say that the portion of land that's in your area uh, that's cropped is about 70%. But not all that land may be available to you because it's either not owned by you or it's, it's leased by others or owned by others. So then you're able to say what portion of the land is accessible for applying manure. Um, and, and another way of looking at some of the land may be forested um, and not available for cropping. So these are all used then to determine the, the distance traveled to apply the manure. So when you get to your crop section, uh, this is what the, the screenshot looks like when you get there. One well, of the first things you have to do is take into account uh, the, the method of manure application. And you'll have a drop down, down box that you'll be able to select uh, about eight to ten different approaches for um, manure application. You have some general crop um, background. Again, this average field size, percentage of land cropped, percentage of land in the, in the area that's available, and so forth. And then also, you have the opportunity to determine the basis for determining your application rates, whether you're doing a one-year nitrogen application or whether you're doing a one-, two-, or four-year phosphorus application. So you can either do a nitrogen or a phosphorus-based um, uh, evaluation. Crop fields, um, you'll be able to select from a library of different crops, and it's a pretty extensive library, so I think you can pretty much find about anything you might want to crop uh, available in this uh, this library. Then this is what your summary will look like, um, your source of manure here on the left. And then um, in the middle of the table, you'll see the manure nutrient concentrations that are available, the crop availability of, um, of nutrients, and then uh, the harvested in terms of manure mass. So again, trying to give lots of information um, so you can uh, use it as needed for uh, making some of these what-if scenario comparisons. So in terms of the economic piece, which would be the last step, um, again, you're going to look at distance and application time, cost of equipment, application, and then fertilizer value of the manure. So I wanted to show you quickly, because um, we don't have a, our colleague for um, working with us on the poultry side is uh, traveling internationally, so I agreed to put my poultry hat on today. And so Todd Applegate gave me an example here he wanted me to show you today. So for a broiler scenario, it would be an industry in a three-phase system where they have a starter, grower, and finisher. Uh, starter from 0 to 14 days, grower to 14 to 28, and then, um, or actually 15 to 28, and then finisher would be 29 to 42. The feed intakes, the phosphorus, and the protein levels are noted here. And then what we did was we compared that to diets that were lower in phosphorus with the use of phytase. So we um, Todd assumed the same intakes the same phase and duration and the same protein levels. So all we're really looking at is a change as we look at these comparisons between the phosphorus as it steps down um, in the uh, first comparison versus the one with the lower phosphorus with phytase. And uh, again, stepping down the phosphorus levels, but they are, at each step, they're all, they're lower in the phytase uh, comparison. So um, here's what it would look like when it's populated into the tool. 
And if you look over here in the upper right, you'll see the phosphorus of 0 0.7, 0 0.6, and 0.55. And the bottom then in the green table, it shows the um, respective phosphorus excreted. And you'll notice a, a number here in the middle of the bottom line that says 432. So that's based on this particular scenario. Um, obviously not too many birds. Um, they've got about uh, 432 pounds of phosphorus. Now if they go in and change these, step it down by the use of phytase, they're able to move that 432 down to, as you note, on this bottom line in the middle. They've now moved that phosphorus excreted down to three, 361. So it's about a 20% decrease in phosphorus excreted. So again, you, you know, with changing the feed costs, and they're all written as zero here now, but with changing the feed costs, you could actually go in and play around with seeing what it would cost you to actually reduce that phosphorus level. So that's all I have um, for this first portion to get you uh, familiarized with how the tool works and give you a little demo on the, the poultry side in particular.